the Uyghur genocide, unmasking human rights abuses in Xinjiang, the situation in Xinjiang, China, involving the treatment of Uyghurs and other ethnic and religious minorities has indeed garnered significant international attention and controversy. The description you provided outlines various allegations and actions attributed to the Chinese government and the reactions from the international community. The allegations against the Chinese government include Allegations and Actions Arbitrary Detention The Chinese government is accused of arbitrarily detaining over a million Uyghurs and other ethnic and religious minorities in internment camps. Detainees are held without legal process, often for extended periods. Forced Labor There are allegations of forced labor within Xinjiang where detainees are subjected to harsh working conditions and are used in manufacturing products, including those destined for international markets. Suppression of religious practices. Reports indicate that religious practices, particularly within the Uyghur Muslim community, have been heavily suppressed. This includes the destruction and closure of mosques and religious schools. Political indoctrination. Detainees in these camps are said to undergo political indoctrination, where they are forced to renounce their cultural and religious beliefs and pledge loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party. Ill treatment. Numerous accounts have surfaced alleging that detainees face severe physical and psychological abuse, including torture, forced labor, and overcrowded conditions in the internment camps, forced sterilization, contraception, and abortion. There are allegations of forced sterilizations, contraception, and abortions aimed at controlling the population growth of Uyghur and other minority groups. Decline in birth rates Official Chinese government statistics have reported a significant decrease in birth rates in predominantly Uyghur regions, such as Hotan and Kashgar, as well as across Xinjiang. These declines have raised concerns about demographic shifts. Allegations of Genocide Some entities have used the term genocide to describe these actions pointing to specific acts that may be in violation of the Genocide Convention. These acts include Causing serious bodily or mental harm. Detainees allegedly endure severe physical and psychological abuse in the camps. Measures to prevent births. The alleged forced sterilization, contraception, and abortion are seen as measures to restrict the birth rates of Uyghurs and other minority groups. Chinese Government Denial the Chinese government has consistently denied these allegations, stating that its actions in Xinjiang are focused on counterterrorism and de-radicalization, and they dispute the characterization of events in Xinjiang as human rights abuses. International Reactions The international response to these allegations has varied. United Nations The United Nations has expressed concerns about potential crimes against humanity in Xinjiang, but has not officially declared it as a genocide. United States. In January 2021, the U.S. government declared the situation a genocide. The U.S. State Department found that there is insufficient evidence to support this characterization but still holds that grave human rights abuses have occurred. Other countries, several countries, including Canada, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Lithuania, and France, have passed non-binding motions or resolutions describing China's actions as genocide or crimes against humanity. Others, such as New Zealand, Belgium, and the Czech Republic, have condemned the Chinese government's actions as severe human rights abuses. International Criminal Court ICC A case brought to the ICC was dismissed in 2020 on jurisdictional grounds, as China is not a party to the ICC statute. It's important to emphasize that this remains a highly complex and contentious issue with significant geopolitical implications. The situation may have evolved since my last knowledge update in January 2022, so staying informed through reliable news sources and international organizations is crucial for an up-to-date understanding of the situation in Xinjiang. The background of the Uyghur identity and the historical context of the Xinjiang region is complex and plays a significant role in the ongoing issues in the area. Uyghur Identity Uyghurs are a Turkic ethnic group native to Xinjiang, a region in western China. They have a distinct cultural and ethnic identity separate from the Han Chinese, who constitute the majority ethnic group in China. Islam holds a central place in Uyghur identity, as they are predominantly Muslim, making them the second largest Muslim ethnic group in China. The Uyghur language, with around 10 million speakers, is an essential part of their identity, 
and it is also spoken by other minority groups in the Xinjiang region. Xinjiang Conflict Xinjiang has been a center of ethnic and political tension, with both Uyghurs and the predominantly Han Chinese government laying claim to the region. This has led to an ongoing ethnic conflict featuring resistance and sporadic violence, as Uyghurs have sought greater autonomy and recognition of their cultural and religious rights. Sinologists Anna Hayes and Michael Clark described Xinjiang as a region undergoing a transformation by the Chinese government, aiming to integrate it fully into the unitary Chinese state. Historical Context Historically, Xinjiang has seen various dynasties exerting control over parts of the region. During the 1700s, Xinjiang came under Chinese rule as a result of the westward expansion of the Manchu-led Qing dynasty. This expansion also resulted in the conquest of Tibet and Mongolia. Xinjiang was a peripheral part of the Qing Empire, but briefly regained independence during the Dungan Revolt, 1862-1877. Following the Dungan Revolt, the Qing dynasty granted the Uyghur population permission to resettle in the former territories of Dzungaria. During the Republican era, 1912-1949, Xinjiang experienced periods of semi-autonomy. Various warlords and leaders, such as the Kumul Khanate, the Ma Clique, and Jean Shurin, had control over different parts of the region. In the 1930s, there was an attempt to establish the first East Turkestan Republic in the Kumul Rebellion, but it was soon conquered by warlord Shan Shurkai with Soviet aid. The Ely Rebellion in 1944 led to the establishment of the Second East Turkestan Republic, which was reliant on the Soviet Union for support. However, this republic was eventually absorbed into the People's Republic of China in 1949 with the establishment of the PRC. The historical context and the diversity of ethnic groups in the Xinjiang region contribute to the complexities of the ongoing issues there. Understanding the historical, cultural, and ethnic dynamics in Xinjiang is essential to grasp the roots of the contemporary situation and the challenges faced by the Uyghur population in the region. The history of Xinjiang and the Uyghur population under the People's Republic of China, from 1949 to the present, has been marked by various phases and conflicts. 1950s to 1970s The Chinese government initiated a mass migration of Han Chinese to Xinjiang during this period which significantly changed the demographic composition of the region. Policies were implemented to suppress cultural identity and religion, impacting the Uyghur population. Emergence of Uyghur Independence Organizations Uyghur independence organizations, with some support from the Soviet Union, began to emerge. The East Turkestan People's Party became the largest of these groups in 1968. During the 1970s, the Soviets supported the United Revolutionary Front of East Turkestan, Erfid, against the Han Chinese. 1980s and Deng Xiaoping Era Under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping, the People's Republic of China, PRC, pursued a policy of cultural liberalization in Xinjiang. The PRC adopted a more flexible language policy nationally, but this approach faced challenges. Shift to Assimilation Policies the Chinese government perceived the cultural liberalization policy as unsuccessful, and from the mid-1980s, it transitioned to a policy of minority assimilation, motivated by geopolitical concerns. Multilingualism and cultural pluralism were increasingly restricted, favoring a monolingual, monocultural model, which contributed to the strengthening of an oppositional Uyghur identity. Efforts to encourage economic development through resource exploitation led to ethnic tensions and discontent in Xinjiang. 1990s In April 1990, a violent uprising in Bairin, near Kashgar, was suppressed by the People's Liberation Army, PLA, resulting in numerous casualties. Attempts to reduce inequality between Han Chinese and ethnic minorities in Xinjiang were deemed unsuccessful in eliminating conflicts partly due to the Chinese government's approach to ethnic relations. 1997 In February 1997, a police crackdown and execution of 30 suspected separatists during Ramadan led to large demonstrations and a PLA crackdown on protesters in the Golja incident, resulting in at least nine deaths. The Urumqi bus bombings in the same month killed nine people and injured 68, with Uyghur exile groups claiming responsibility. A bus bombing in March 1997 killed two people, 
with responsibility claimed by Uyghur separatists in the Turkey-based Organization for East Turkestan Freedom, 2009-2016. The July 2009 Yurumki riots, sparked by the Shabwan incident, resulted in over 100 deaths and widespread unrest. In the aftermath, there were coordinated attacks by Uyghur terrorists against Han Chinese in Xinjiang, with incidents like the Xinjiang unrest, September 2009, the Hotan attack, 2011, the Kunming attack, 2014, and multiple attacks in Yurumki, April and May 2014. Some of these attacks were orchestrated by Uyghur separatist groups, including the Turkestan Islamic Party. International Reactions Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan strongly denounced the treatment of the Uyghur community and called for an end to China's forced assimilation policies. He referred to the incidents as a genocide. Erdogan's statements temporarily strained China's relations with Turkey. These historical events highlight the complex and contentious nature of the situation in Xinjiang, marked by cultural, ethnic, and political tensions between the Uyghurs and the Chinese government. The region has experienced periods of conflict and violence, with ongoing debates about the nature of the Chinese government's policies and their impact on the Uyghur population. The period from the mid-2000s to the present has witnessed significant shifts in the Chinese government's policies in Xinjiang, particularly with regard to stability maintenance, counterterrorism, and assimilation efforts. Here are key developments. 2008 Beijing Olympics in Wei Win, Stability Maintenance In the lead-up to the 2008 Beijing Olympics, the Chinese government placed a heightened focus on Wei Win, or stability maintenance, leading to intensified repression across the country. Concerns were raised within the Communist Party about the potential consequences of excessive measures to combat perceived instability. Changes in Leadership In April 2010, Following the July 2009 Yurumki riots, Zhang Qinxian replaced Wang Lichuan as the CCP secretary in Xinjiang. Wang Lichuan had been known for his religious policies in Xinjiang for 14 years. Shift towards a monocultural society. In the aftermath of the 2009 Yurumki riots, there was a growing call within the Communist Party to create a more monocultural society with a single state race, a goal aimed at making China a new type of superpower. Policies to advance this goal began to be implemented by Zhang Qinxian. Intensification of Repression Under Xi Jinping Xi Jinping, China's paramount leader, took a firm stance on combating terrorism and unrest in Xinjiang. Following an attack in Yunnan province, he advocated for uniting the people and building a copper and iron wall against terrorism. He emphasized a harsh approach and declared, We must be as harsh as them, and show absolutely no mercy. In 2014, a secret meeting of Communist Party leadership was held in Beijing to address the issue. This led to the launch of the Strike Hard campaign against violent terrorism. The campaign, initiated in May 2014 in Xinjiang, was publicly announced and endorsed by Xi Jinping. He emphasized that the ruling strategy in Xinjiang was correct and should be maintained. Restrictions and Separation of Uyghur Families In 2016, a brief window of opportunity allowed Uyghurs with passports to leave China. Many took advantage of this opportunity, leaving their relatives and children without passports behind. Some families have not been reunited. The People's War and Xin Chuang was leadership. The Communist Party leadership in Xinjiang, following Beijing's guidance, launched a People's War against the three evil forces of separatism, terrorism, and extremism. This effort involved deploying a significant number of party cadres to Xinjiang and the launch of the Civil Servant Family Pair-Up Program. In 2016, Chen Quan will replace Zhang Qinxian as the CCP secretary in Xinjiang. Under his leadership, tens of thousands of additional police officers were recruited, and society was categorized into three groups, trusted, average, and untrustworthy. Chin Kuang would emphasize taking a proactive and aggressive stance in implementing the crackdown. These policy changes and the intensification of government actions have played a central role in shaping the situation in Xinjiang and have been accompanied by reports of human rights abuses, including mass detentions, forced labor, and cultural assimilation efforts. 
The government's approach in Xinjiang has garnered international attention and raised concerns about human rights violations and the treatment of the Uyghur population. The period from 2017 onward has seen the implementation of various regulations and policies in Xinjiang, as well as the expansion of internment camps, leading to international concern and scrutiny. Chen Chiuan was rally and crackdown. Following a meeting with Xi Jinping, Chen Quanwo organized a rally in Urumqi, where he addressed 10,000 troops, emphasizing an offensive against perceived threats. He declared a smashing, obliterating offensive and ordered mass arrests, stating that they would bury the corpses of terrorists and terror gangs in the vast sea of the People's War. Bans and Regulations April 1, 2017 New bans and regulations were implemented, targeting religious and cultural expressions of the Uyghur population. These bans included prohibitions on abnormally long beards and wearing veils in public. Restrictions were also imposed on not watching state-run television or listening to radio broadcasts, refusing to abide by family planning policies, or refusing to allow one's children to attend state-run schools. Race-based monitoring and enhanced border controls. In 2017, China's Ministry of Public Security began procuring race-based monitoring systems, reportedly capable of identifying whether an individual was Uyghur. This allowed the addition of a Uyghur alarm to surveillance systems. Enhanced border controls were implemented, with a presumption of guilt in the absence of evidence, enabling the arrest of individuals on suspicion of terrorism. Restrictions on Reporting In 2017, 73% of foreign journalists in China reported being restricted or prohibited from reporting in Xinjiang, a significant increase from 42% in 2016. Expansion of re-education efforts and internment camps Alleged re-education efforts began in 2014 and were expanded in 2017. These efforts targeted the Uyghur population. Chen Quanwo ordered the camps to be managed like the military and defended like a prison. Internment camps were constructed to house participants in the re-education programs, with most of them being Uyghurs. The Chinese government initially referred to these facilities as vocational education and training centers. In 2019, they were renamed vocational training centers. The number of detainees in these camps increased significantly, with the Chinese government maintaining that most had been released. By 2019, the use of these centers appeared to have ended due to international pressure, and some sites were converted or abandoned. As of October 2022, there have been no comprehensive independent surveys of these centers, but spot checks by journalists have indicated that some of them have been converted for other purposes, such as coronavirus quarantine facilities, teacher schools, and vocational schools. These developments have raised widespread international concern and condemnation regarding the treatment of the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. The Chinese government has conducted an extensive propaganda campaign aimed at defending its actions in Xinjiang and shaping the narrative around its policies in the region. Here are key aspects of this campaign. Denial and cover-up 2017-2018 Initially, China denied the existence of the Xinjiang internment camps and attempted to cover up their existence. In 2018, after widespread reporting forced China to admit the existence of the camps, the government initiated a campaign to portray the camps as humane and to deny human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Expansion of Propaganda 2020-2021 In 2020 and 2021, the propaganda campaign expanded as international backlash against government policies in Xinjiang grew. The Chinese government appeared concerned that it was losing control of the narrative. Attacks on Credibility and Character Chinese authorities responded to allegations of abuse by Uyghur women by launching attacks on their credibility and character. This included disclosing confidential medical data and personal information to undermine witnesses and their testimony. The goal of these attacks appeared to be silencing further criticism rather than refuting specific claims made by critics. Targeting International Journalists Chinese government propaganda campaigns have targeted international journalists who covered human rights abuses in Xinjiang. For example, BBC News reporter John Sudworth faced harassment and propaganda campaigns. The attacks led to Sudworth and his wife fleeing China for Taiwan due to concerns for their safety. Use of Social Media China has used social media platforms as a part of its propaganda campaign. 
This includes purchasing Facebook advertisements to spread propaganda and incite doubt about the existence and scope of human rights violations in Xinjiang. Douyin, the mainland Chinese sister app to TikTok, presents users with Chinese state propaganda related to human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Promotion of Propaganda Videos The Chinese government released propaganda videos titled Xinjiang is a Wonderful Land and a musical titled The Wings of Songs, which portrayed Xinjiang as harmonious and peaceful, devoid of repression, mass surveillance, and Islamic culture. These videos aim to present an idyllic image of the region while denying allegations of abuse. Influence Campaign on Twitter and YouTube In June 2021, ProPublica documented a Chinese government-backed propaganda campaign on Twitter and YouTube, which involved more than 5,000 videos showing Uyghurs in Xinjiang denying abuses and criticizing foreign officials and corporations. Some of the accounts associated with these videos were removed on YouTube as part of efforts to combat spam and influence operations. CCP-backed Uyghur Influencers in October 2022, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute documented CCP-backed Uyghur influencers in Xinjiang posting propaganda videos on Chinese and Western social media platforms to push back against abuse allegations. Some of these influencer accounts were suspended on Twitter for alleged inauthenticity. The Chinese government's propaganda campaign has been extensive and multifaceted, aimed at shaping international perceptions of its actions in Xinjiang and countering allegations of human rights abuses. It has utilized both domestic and international social media platforms to influence public opinion and narratives surrounding Xinjiang. China has framed its policies in Xinjiang within the context of the global war on terror that emerged in the early 2000s. Here are key points regarding China's use of counterterrorism justification. Equating separatism with terrorism. China has used the rhetoric of the global war on terror to frame acts of separatist and ethnic unrest in Xinjiang as manifestations of Islamist terrorism. The Chinese government has portrayed its policies in Xinjiang as part of a broader anti-terrorism campaign to legitimize its actions. Islamophobia and Fear of Terrorism Discourses Scholars like Sean Roberts and David Tobin have argued that China has used Islamophobia and fear of terrorism as discourses to justify repressive policies against Uyghurs. They emphasize that violence against Uyghurs should be seen in the context of Chinese colonialism rather than solely as an anti-terrorism effort. Conflation of Uyghur nationalism with terrorism R.E.N. Dwyer has noted that the U.S. war on terror provided China with an opportunity to conflate Uyghur nationalism with terrorism, particularly through state-run media. Dwyer argues that China has overstated the influence of fundamentalist forms of Islam within Xinjiang, such as Salafism, as it is tempered by Uyghur Sufism. Expulsion of Journalists for Questioning Official Line In December 2015, China effectively expelled a French journalist, Ursula Gauthier, for questioning the official line equating ethnic violence in Xinjiang with global terrorism. Gauthier faced an abusive and intimidating campaign by Chinese state media. UN Criticism of Broad Definitions of Terrorism In August 2018, the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination criticized the broad definition of terrorism and vague references to extremism used in Chinese legislation. The committee noted that many reports suggested the detention of Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities on the pretext of countering terrorism. Misuse of Counterterrorism Pretext In 2019, multiple sources, including the Wall Street Journal, Sam Brownback, and Nathan Sales, criticized the Chinese government for consistently misusing counterterrorism as a pretext for cultural suppression and human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Sentencing of Officials on Terrorism and Extremism Charges In 2021, Shirza Bawudin and Sadr Sawat, former officials in Xinjiang, were sentenced to death with a two-year reprieve on terrorism and extremism charges. Three other educators and two textbook editors received lesser sentences. China's use of the counterterrorism justification has been a contentious issue, with critics arguing that it is used to justify repressive policies and human rights abuses in Xinjiang. The international community has expressed concerns about the broad definitions of terrorism and extremism that have been used in Chinese legislation and their impact on ethnic minorities in the region.
The destruction and restrictions imposed on mosques, Muslim shrines, and cemeteries in Xinjiang have been a significant aspect of the Chinese government's policies in the region. Here are key points related to these issues. Destruction of mosques Systematic destruction of mosques in Xinjiang has been reported, with an estimated 16,000 mosques having been destroyed or damaged. Minarets have been knocked down, and decorative features have been removed or painted over. The destruction of religious sites, including mosques, has raised concerns about the impact on Uyghur culture and religious practices. Retaliation against unofficial mosques Reports from 2005 suggested that retaliation against mosques not sponsored by the Chinese state was prevalent. Official sources indicated that Uyghurs should not have to build new places for religious activities. Restrictions on Minors The Chinese government has imposed restrictions on minors participating in religious activities in Xinjiang, a measure that has been criticized for lacking a basis in Chinese law. Structural Damage and Raising of Religious Sites an analysis by The Guardian found that over one-third of mosques and religious sites in China suffered significant structural damage between 2016 and 2018. Approximately one-sixth of these sites were completely razed. This destruction included important religious sites such as the Tomb of Imam Asim and the Ordem Shrine, both of which have significance for Uyghur Muslims. Plaque Removal at ID Ka Mosque The ID Ka Mosque, China's largest, saw the removal of a plaque containing Quranic scriptures from outside its front entrance in 2018. This action was criticized as part of the Chinese regime's efforts to eliminate the Islamic faith among Uyghurs. Decline in Functioning Mosques Reports indicated a decline in the number of functioning mosques in Xinjiang. Some reports suggested that mosques had been turned into tourist attractions and that mosque attendance had decreased significantly. Limited Easing of Religious Restrictions Starting in early 2020, Chinese authorities, in response to international criticism, began to ease some religious restrictions in Xinjiang and reopen some mosques. However, reports suggested that most Uyghurs were still hesitant to return to the mosques due to fear of previous crackdowns. Hui Muslims were said to have been given greater leeway than Uyghur Muslims. The destruction and restrictions on mosques and religious sites in Xinjiang have been a subject of international concern and have raised questions about the preservation of Uyghur cultural and religious heritage. The education system in Xinjiang has undergone significant changes, with a shift towards Mandarin Chinese as the primary medium of instruction. Here are key points related to education in Xinjiang. Bilingual Education Policy In 2011, Schools in Xinjiang implemented a policy of bilingual education. The primary medium of instruction is standard Chinese, Mandarin, with limited hours allocated to the study of Uyghur literature. The policy aims to promote the use of Mandarin Chinese in education, which has raised concerns about the preservation of the Uyghur language. Impact on Uyghur Students Uyghur students are increasingly attending residential schools far from their home communities where they have limited opportunities to speak Uyghur. A 2020 report from Radio Free Asia highlighted the introduction of monolingual Chinese language education in a significant high school in Kashgar, which was previously providing bilingual education, forced teaching in internment camps. Saragul Sabe, an ethnic Kazakh teacher who fled China, described being forced to teach at an internment camp. She reported the camp's conditions as cramped and unhygienic, with detainees receiving basic sustenance. Saabe mentioned that detainees were compelled to learn Chinese, attend indoctrination classes, and make public confessions. She also raised serious allegations of rape, torture, and the forced administration of a medicine that could cause sterility or cognitive impairment. Ban on Uyghur language textbooks. In 2021, the standard Uyghur language textbooks used in Xinjiang since the early 2000s were outlawed. The authors and editors of these textbooks were sentenced to death or life imprisonment on separatism charges. The Chinese government argued that the textbooks contained passages promoting ethnic separatism, violence, terrorism, and religious extremism. It cited the use of these books as inspiration for the 2009 anti-government riot in Yurumki.
The shift towards Mandarin Chinese as the dominant language of instruction has been a significant part of the Chinese government's efforts to assimilate Uyghurs and has raised concerns about the preservation of Uyghur culture and language. The reported conditions in internment camps and allegations of forced teaching have also attracted international attention and condemnation. The Chinese government's actions in Xinjiang have impacted various aspects of Uyghur life, including intellectuals, religious figures, cemeteries, and marriage. Here are the key points related to these areas. Detained intellectuals and religious figures In 2019, the Uyghur Human Rights Project identified 386 Uyghur intellectuals who had been imprisoned, detained, or disappeared since early 2017. This crackdown has affected academics, scholars, and religious leaders. Uyghur economist Ilham Todi was sentenced to life in prison in 2014. His sentencing was widely criticized as unjustified and deplorable by organizations like Amnesty International. Prominent Uyghur anthropologist Rahail Dodd, known for her work in preserving Islamic shrines, traditional songs, and folklore, disappeared. Uyghur imam Abdul Bar Ahmed, previously lauded as a five-star imam, was sentenced to over five years in prison in 2018 for taking his son to a religious school not sanctioned by the state. Destruction of Cemeteries Reports from agents France Presa, AFP, in September 2019 and CNN in January 2020 documented the destruction of numerous Uyghur cemeteries in Xinjiang. Satellite imagery showed the ongoing campaign, and some exposed human bones were observed in certain sites. The Chinese government claimed that the destruction of cemeteries was due to relocations and lack of maintenance. However, these actions were linked to efforts to control Uyghurs and exert influence over their culture. Notable cemeteries, including the Sultanum Cemetery in Hotan, were demolished, with claims that graves were relocated. Marriage and Social Engineering The Chinese government has encouraged intermarriage between Uyghurs and Han Chinese, offering various incentives to mixed couples. These incentives include cash rewards, preferential treatment in employment and housing, and free education for the couples and their families. The promotion of intermarriage is seen by the authorities as a way to enhance ethnic unity and fusion. Social media campaigns celebrating mixed marriages have been promoted as a means of bringing different ethnic groups closer. Such policies have raised concerns that they aim to diminish Uyghur ethnic identity and culture by assimilating Uyghurs into Han-dominated relationships. The Chinese government's actions in these areas are part of its broader efforts to control, assimilate, and exert influence over the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. Clothing Restrictions Chinese authorities discourage Uyghur women from wearing headscarves, veils, and other customary Islamic attire. On May 20, 2014, a protest erupted in Alakaga, Kuka, Aksu Prefecture, when 25 women and schoolgirls were detained for wearing headscarves. This led to a clash with the police, resulting in casualties. There have been incidents where the wearing of traditional clothing has led to detention and arrest, as revealed in documents leaked from Xinjiang's internment camps. These restrictions are part of the broader campaign to control Uyghur culture and religious expression. Children's Names In 2015, a list of band names for children, known as the Naming Rules for Ethnic Minorities, was introduced in Hotan. The list prohibited names with strong religious connotations, including Islam, Quran, Mecca, Jihad, Imam, Saddam, Hajj, and Medina. This naming restriction was subsequently extended to cover the entire Xinjiang region. Legislation in 2017 made it illegal to give children names that the Chinese government considered to exaggerate religious fervor, further emphasizing the restrictions on religious expressions and names. This included a ban on naming children Muhammad. These measures reflect the Chinese government's efforts to exert control over Uyghur culture, religious practices, and even names, as part of its campaign to suppress religious identity and promote assimilation. Human Rights Abuses in Xinjiang Internment camps. Since 2016, the Chinese government has operated a network of internment camps as part of its strategy to govern Xinjiang. These camps are used to detain ethnic minorities en masse, primarily targeting Uyghurs. The mass detentions peaked in 2018 but have since shifted towards forced labor programs. 
Mass detentions, reports, and estimates on the number of detainees vary, with figures ranging from around 1 million to 1.8 million Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities held in these camps. These estimates are based on research, investigations, and evidence provided by various sources, including scholars, activists, and international organizations. Coercive measures. Inside the internment camps, detainees are subjected to coercive measures, including forced labor, ideological indoctrination, and harsh living conditions. Reports suggest that conditions inside the camps are dire, with allegations of abuse, violence, and malnutrition. Deaths. There have been numerous reports of deaths occurring inside the camps due to inadequate living conditions, malnutrition, and violence. These reports have raised concerns about the well-being and safety of detainees. Human rights violations. The internment camps have drawn widespread condemnation from the international community for their violations of human rights, including arbitrary detention, forced labor, and restrictions on religious and cultural practices. Some have even likened these actions to a form of cultural genocide. The Chinese government has faced significant criticism and allegations of human rights abuses in Xinjiang, leading to increased scrutiny and calls for accountability from the international community. Torture and coercive measures. Reports from various sources, including former detainees, exiled individuals, and rights groups, have indicated that Uyghurs in Xinjiang have been subjected to torture and other forms of abuse by Chinese authorities. These reports include the following details. A former Chinese police detective in Europe revealed details of systematic torture of Uyghurs in detention camps in Xinjiang, including his own participation in such acts. Mirigol Tursen, a Uyghur detainee, described her experiences at the camps, including being drugged, subjected to intrusive medical examinations, and strapped in a chair to receive electric shocks. She alleged that interrogators told her that being a Uyghur is a crime. Kirat Samarkand, another former detainee, described being forced to wear an iron clothes suit that weighed over 50 pounds, restricting his movements and causing severe discomfort. Reports have suggested that torture methods such as waterboarding have been used as part of the indoctrination process. Compulsory sterilizations and contraception. There have been reports of forced sterilizations in the administration of birth control measures to Uyghur women in Xinjiang. These reports include the following details. In 2019, reports of forced sterilization began to surface. Some Uyghur women claim that they were forcibly sterilized by tubal ligation while in detention. In 2020, interviews with former detainees indicated that women were forced to take birth control pills or were injected with fluids that caused them to stop having periods. It was suggested that hormonal medication, such as Depo-Provera, was used for this purpose. In April 2021, exiled Uyghur Dr. Golgine reported that forced sterilizations of Uyghurs, especially women, had been ongoing since the 1980s. She described a sharp increase in sterilizations after 2014, aiming to ensure that Uyghurs would remain a minority in the region. These reports and allegations of torture, coercive measures, and forced sterilizations have raised significant concerns and have been condemned by the international community. Brainwashing and Indoctrination Reports and leaked documents have shed light on the extent of brainwashing and indoctrination efforts within the Xinjiang detention camps. These efforts are aimed at erasing Uyghur identity, instilling loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party, and suppressing religious beliefs. Here are some examples and details. Former detainee Karat Samarkand described his camp routine, which included detainees being forced to sing songs praising Chinese leader Xi Jinping before being allowed to eat. Detainees were also required to memorize a list of what Samarkand referred to as 126 lies about religion, emphasizing that religion is considered negative and belief in the Communist Party is encouraged. Leaked documents advise that students, particularly children, should be told that their missing parents have not committed crimes but have been infected by unhealthy thoughts. This suggests an effort to suppress independent thinking and instill loyalty to the party. It has been reported that children of detainees are often sent to state-run orphanages where they are subjected to brainwashing, forced to forget their ethnic roots, and immersed in Han Chinese culture under policies such as the Xinjiang Classrooms Policy. In some cases, 
Individuals like Golbahar Haidawaji reported being coerced into denouncing their own family members, demonstrating the extent of psychological pressure and indoctrination. These accounts highlight the systematic nature of the brainwashing and indoctrination efforts within the detention camps, where detainees are subjected to intense psychological manipulation and forced to adopt the Chinese Communist Party's ideology. Forced Labor Forced labor has been a significant issue in Xinjiang, particularly within the context of the cotton industry and the Xinjiang internment camps. Here are some key points. The Uyghur Human Rights Project has described Xinjiang as a cotton gulag, where forced labor is pervasive throughout the entire cotton supply chain. Uyghurs, including children, have been subjected to forced labor in labor camps, where they are required to perform various types of hard labor, such as picking cotton, shoveling gravel, and making bricks. BuzzFeed News reported that forced labor on a massive scale is likely occurring inside the Xinjiang internment camps. These camps are said to have over 135 factory facilities, covering millions of square feet of land. Former detainees have reported being forced to work without a choice and receiving minimal or no pay for their labor. Job listings for transferring Uyghur laborers in groups of 50 to 100 people have been posted on a Chinese website hosted by Baidu. These workers are subjected to half-military style management and direct supervision. The Xinjiang government's official labor transfer program is intended to provide employment opportunities for surplus rural labor. This program is associated with forced labor practices. Several companies have been identified as benefiting from Uyghur forced labor. In response to these allegations, some companies have pledged to check their supply chains and ensure better work conditions, while others have not provided any response to related inquiries. The Chinese government has pressured foreign companies to reject claims of human rights abuses, and some companies have faced boycotts or backlash in China after criticizing the treatment of Uyghurs. Forced labor, particularly within the cotton industry, is a major concern associated with human rights abuses in Xinjiang. It is a complex issue that involves various stakeholders, including the Chinese government, companies, and international responses to these allegations medical experiments and organized mass rape and sexual torture. The allegations of medical experiments and organized mass rape and sexual torture in Xinjiang are extremely serious and disturbing. Here's what is known about these allegations. Former inmates have reported being subjected to medical experimentation, although the details and extent of these experiments are not well documented. BBC News and other sources have reported accounts of organized mass rape and sexual torture carried out by Chinese authorities in the internment camps. These allegations include gang rape, forced penetrations with electric batons, and other forms of sexual abuse. Former detainees have publicly accused camp guards and officials of rape, sexual torture, and mass sexual abuse. Saragol Saatbe, a teacher who was forced to work in the camps, described the camp guards picking women and young women for sexual abuse. Tersene Zaya Wooden, another former detainee, reported that women were taken from their cells every night to be raped by Chinese men in masks, and she personally experienced gang rape during her detention. Kelbin Ersetic, an Uzbek woman from Xinjiang, stated that Chinese police sexually abused detainees during electric shock tortures. The Chinese government has consistently denied all allegations of human rights abuses within the internment camps. In addition, Reuters reported that Chinese officials disclosed the personal medical information of women witnesses in an attempt to discredit them. A BBC report in February 2021 detailed the systemic sexual abuse taking place within the camps, alleging that it was part of a broader rape culture involving both police and outsiders. These allegations have raised significant international concern and outrage. Investigations and fact-finding missions are ongoing to gather more evidence and assess the extent of these abuses. IUDs and birth control The use of intrauterine devices, IUDs, and birth control in Xinjiang has raised concerns regarding China's population control policies and their impact on minority communities. Here's what is known about this issue. China performs regular pregnancy checks on hundreds of thousands of minority women in Xinjiang. Adrian Zins, a researcher, reported that the majority of new Chinese IUD placements in 2018 occurred in Xinjiang, even though the region constitutes only 1.8% of the country's population. 
Another Xinjiang University professor, Lin Fangfei, argued that 8.7% of IUD operations were performed in Xinjiang. The birth rates in counties with a majority of ethnic minorities began to fall in 2015, the same year the Chinese government associated population growth with religious extremism. Prior to this decline, the Uyghur population had a growth rate 2.6 times that of the Han population of between 2005 and 2015. According to Zinza's analysis, Chinese government documents plan to sterilize a significant percentage of childbearing age women in Uyghur majority areas in 2019. These documents suggest that the Chinese government aimed to sterilize between 14% and 34% of childbearing age married women in certain predominantly Uyghur counties. Official records from Karakaks County leaked to the Financial Times showed that the most common reason for detaining Uyghurs in camps was the violation of family planning policies, indicating that these policies are closely tied to the suppression of the Uyghur population. An Associated Press investigation in 2020 revealed that forced birth control in Xinjiang was far more widespread and systematic than previously known, with authorities forcing IUD insertions, sterilizations, and abortions on hundreds of thousands of Uyghur and other minority women. The Chinese government has stated that the decline in birth rates is due to the comprehensive implementation of family planning policies, but authorities do not acknowledge genocide or forced sterilization. Chinese officials argue that such policies empower Uyghur women. These allegations of forced birth control, sterilization, and population control policies have been met with international concern and condemnation, and investigations into the extent of these practices are ongoing. Forced cohabitation, co-sleeping, rape, and abortion. Beginning in 2018, the Chinese government initiated the Pair Up and Become Family program which involved assigning Han Chinese government workers to live in the homes of Uyghur families for various purposes, including monitoring resistance to assimilation and observing religious and cultural practices. Here are some key aspects of this program. Over one million Chinese government workers were forcibly living in the homes of Uyghur families as part of this program. The program involved assigning Han Chinese men to live in Uyghur households and even sleep in the same beds as Uyghur women. These government workers referred to themselves as relatives and were tasked with promoting ethnic unity. There have been allegations that these government workers regularly shared beds with Uyghur women, sometimes resulting in pregnancies and forced marriages. Some Uyghur activists described the program as a form of mass rape disguised as marriage. Chinese officials have maintained that such co-sleeping is acceptable, provided that a distance of one meter is maintained between the men and the women in the Uyghur home. However, there is skepticism that such restraint is enforced. Human Rights Watch has condemned the program as a deeply invasive forced assimilation practice, and the World Uyghur Congress has described it as endangering the safety, security, and well-being of family members. There have also been reports of pregnant Uyghur women facing coercion from Chinese officials to undergo abortions, sometimes with the aim of preventing their family members from being detained in internment camps. These practices have raised serious human rights concerns and have been widely criticized by the international community. Investigations into the extent of these practices continue, and there are ongoing calls for accountability and transparency regarding the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Organ Harvesting Allegations and Concerns There have been allegations and concerns regarding organ harvesting in China, including involving Uyghurs. Here are key points related to this issue. Prevalence of organ harvesting. Ethan Gutman, a researcher, has claimed that organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience became prevalent when the Chinese government targeted Uyghurs in security crackdowns and strike hard campaigns. During the 1990s, Gutman suggests that the practice declined by 1999 but resurfaced with the targeting of other groups, such as the Falun Gong. Resurfacing concerns. In the 2010s, concerns about organ harvesting from Uyghurs resurfaced. While there was no direct evidence of Uyghur organ harvesting, there were increasing concerns about the vulnerability of Uyghurs to such practices. China Tribunal's Findings In May 2020, the China Tribunal, an independent tribunal, issued a unanimous determination expressing concerns about organ harvesting from Uyghurs. The tribunal did not yet have direct evidence of the practice but found credible reasons to be worried about it. 
Gutman's claims. In November 2020, Ethan Gutman made allegations about a former hospital in Aksu, China, that had been converted into a Xinjiang internment camp. He claimed that the facility was used to streamline the organ harvesting process and provide a steady supply of organs from Uyghurs. Allegations of organ sales to Saudi customers. A Chinese woman alleged that Uyghurs were killed to provide halal organs for primarily Saudi customers. She claimed that, in one instance in 2006, 37 Saudi clients received organs from killed Uyghurs at a Chinese hospital. Some individuals, including Dr. Inver Todi, a former oncology surgeon in Xinjiang, believe these allegations to be credible. It's important to note that these allegations and concerns have not been conclusively proven and the Chinese government has denied them. Investigations and discussions around organ harvesting in China, including its potential impact on Uyghurs, are ongoing, and transparency and accountability are important in addressing these concerns. Forced labor during the COVID-19 pandemic During the COVID-19 pandemic, there were reports of the Chinese government imposing forced labor conditions on Uyghurs. Here are key points related to this issue. Transportation to Forced Factory Labor Programs In January 2020, videos emerged on Douyin, a Chinese social media platform, showing large numbers of Uyghurs being transported by airplanes, trains, and buses to forced factory labor programs. Forced labor in factories In March 2020, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASPI, published a report that revealed that at least 80,000 Uyghurs were forcibly removed from Xinjiang for forced labor in around 27 factories across China. Involvement of international corporations The report also implicated several international corporations in sourcing products from these factories, including Abercrombie and Fitch, Adidas, Amazon, Apple, BMW, Fila, Gap. H&M, Inditex, Marks & Spencer, Nike, North Face, Puma, PVH, Samsung, and Uniqlo. Forced Cotton Picking Over 570,000 Uyghurs were reportedly forced to pick cotton by hand in Xinjiang. This practice raised concerns about forced labor in the cotton industry. Population Density Reduction Reports suggested that the Chinese forced labor system was designed to reduce Uyghur population density raising concerns about the potential broader demographic and human rights implications of such policies. By 2021, more than 600,000 Uyghurs had been relocated to industrial workplaces as part of forced labor programs. These allegations have sparked international concern and calls for accountability. It is important to note that these allegations have been a subject of debate and concern, with international organizations and governments seeking transparency and accountability regarding forced labor practices in China. Actions outside of China involving Uyghurs China has faced accusations of coordinating efforts to exert pressure on Uyghurs living overseas to return to China. These efforts often involve using family members in China to apply pressure on members of the diaspora. Chinese officials have denied these allegations, dismissing them as fabrications. China's extensive surveillance system also extends overseas, with a specific focus on monitoring the Uyghur diaspora. Reports have indicated that China's efforts to monitor Uyghurs abroad include aggressive cyber espionage targeting journalists, dissidents, and individuals deemed disloyal to Beijing. In March 2021, Facebook reported that hackers based in China were conducting cyber espionage against members of the Uyghur diaspora. Uyghurs living in various countries including the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia, have been detained and deported back to China, resulting in family separations. Rights activists have expressed concerns that, despite Western nations taking China to task over its treatment of Uyghurs, countries in the Middle East and beyond might increasingly cooperate with China's efforts to crack down on Uyghurs both domestically and abroad. According to a joint report from the Uyghur Human Rights Project and the Oxus Society for Central Asian Affairs, there have been 1,546 documented cases of Uyghurs being detained and deported at the request of Chinese authorities in 28 countries from 1997 to March 2021. These actions outside of China have raised significant concerns about the safety and rights of Uyghurs in various parts of the world and have garnered international attention and criticism. Use of Biometric and Surveillance Technology 
Chinese authorities employ advanced biometric technology to monitor and track individuals, particularly in Xinjiang. This technology includes Biometric data collection Chinese authorities have been reported to collect biometric data from Uyghurs, including drawing blood, scanning faces, recording fingerprints, and documenting voices. This extensive biometric data collection is used to track and monitor individuals. Genetic material collection China has been accused of collecting genetic material from millions of Uyghurs, which raises concerns about the use of DNA data for surveillance and identification. Facial recognition technology China uses facial recognition technology to sort individuals by their ethnicity, particularly to identify Uyghurs. Advanced surveillance infrastructure The Chinese government has invested significantly in the development of advanced surveillance infrastructure. This includes the installation of security cameras, video analytics hubs, intelligent monitoring systems, big data centers, police checkpoints, and drones in Xinjiang. DJI, a drone manufacturer, has provided surveillance drones to local police. National Projects China has launched major national projects, including the Skynet Project and the Sharp Eyes Project which aim to achieve comprehensive surveillance coverage with no blind spots using technologies like facial recognition. Surveillance companies Chinese companies, such as SenseTime, CloudWalk, E2, MegVI, and HikVision, have developed algorithms that enable the Chinese government to track and monitor the Uyghur population. U.S. Sanctions In response to concerns about the exploitation of Uyghur DNA data, the United States Department of Commerce sanctioned several Chinese firms, including subsidiaries of BGI Group. The sanctions were imposed for violating the human rights of Uyghur Muslims by exploiting their genetic information. These developments in biometric and surveillance technology raise significant human rights and privacy concerns, as they are used to monitor and control the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. Biometric Data Collection Chinese authorities, particularly under the leadership of Chen Kuanghua, have conducted extensive biometric data collection in Xinjiang, targeting the Uyghur population. This data includes DNA samples. Under the Physicals for All program, every Xinjiang resident between the ages of 12 and 65 was required to provide DNA samples. This mass DNA collection was a part of the purported medical care program. Additional data. Along with DNA samples, data on various biometric identifiers, including blood types, fingerprints, voice prints, and iris patterns, were collected. Blood samples. In some areas, officials collected hundreds of blood samples for the purpose of biometric identification. Forensic DNA Lab. A forensic DNA lab, supervised by the Institute of Forensic Science of China, was established in Tungsuk. This lab used specialized software including that from Thermo Fisher Scientific to analyze DNA samples. Thermo Fisher Response In response to concerns regarding the use of its technology for genetic analysis in Xinjiang, Thermo Fisher Scientific declared that it would cease sales to the Xinjiang region. GPS Tracking of Cars Chinese authorities have mandated the installation of GPS tracking devices in vehicles in the northwest region of China, including Xinjiang. This measure is justified as a security precaution against Islamist extremists and separatists. It is intended to monitor and track all vehicles in the region, citing the threat of international terrorism and the use of vehicles for illicit activities. These initiatives highlight the extensive data collection and surveillance measures that have been implemented in Xinjiang, raising significant privacy and human rights concerns. The actions of the Chinese government in Xinjiang have been described and labeled in various ways by different individuals and organizations. These include Genocide Many experts, scholars, and human rights advocates, particularly after the release of the Xinjiang papers and China cables, have referred to the situation in Xinjiang as genocide. This term implies the deliberate and systematic destruction of a racial, ethnic, religious, or national group. It is considered one of the most serious international crimes under the United Nations Genocide Convention. Cultural Genocide The term cultural genocide has been used to describe the Chinese government's policies in Xinjiang. This refers to actions aimed at erasing the cultural identity, heritage, and practices of a specific group. 
It may involve the suppression of language, religion, customs, and traditions. Ethnocide. Ethnocide is another term used to describe the situation in Xinjiang. It is often used interchangeably with cultural genocide and refers to actions aimed at the destruction or suppression of the culture, identity, and way of life of a particular ethnic group. Crimes against humanity. Some have characterized China's actions in Xinjiang as crimes against humanity. This term encompasses a wide range of acts, including murder, enslavement, torture, and persecution, when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population. Settler colonialism Settler colonialism refers to the colonization and occupation of a territory, often involving the displacement and replacement of the indigenous population with settlers. While not as commonly used in the context of Xinjiang, some have raised comparisons with settler colonialism due to the state-led migration of Han Chinese into the region. These labels reflect the severity and complexity of the situation in Xinjiang and are the subject of ongoing international debate and legal scrutiny. Different individuals, organizations, and governments may use these terms based on their perspectives and assessments of the situation. The situation in Xinjiang has increasingly been labeled as genocide by various experts, scholars, politicians, and international organizations. The use of the term genocide reflects the gravity and severity of the human rights abuses being reported in the region. Here's a summary of the progression of the use of the term. Early descriptions as genocide 2019 and before the first use of the term genocide in connection with China's treatment of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in Xinjiang can be traced back to experts, scholars, and human rights activists who began expressing their concerns as early as 2019. At that time, they pointed to alarming trends, such as mass arrests of Uyghur intellectuals and academics, as indicative of a genocidal intent. Growing use of the term 2020 as more information and reports emerged, including evidence of mass forced sterilizations, forced abortions, and other severe human rights abuses, more scholars, commentators, and lawyers began to describe the situation in Xinjiang as genocide. The evidence for this characterization was seen as increasingly substantial and alarming. Criteria of the Genocide Convention some experts noted that the actions of the Chinese government met at least one of the five criteria outlined in the United Nations Genocide Convention. This included actions related to the suppression of birth rates as a means to reduce the Uyghur population. International Actions and Declarations 2020-2021 Several countries, governmental bodies, and international organizations took significant steps to officially recognize China's actions in Xinjiang as genocide. The U.S. led the way by officially designating it as such, followed by Canada and the Dutch Parliament. This official designation carried significant legal and moral weight. Legal Reports and Expert Opinions 2021 Legal Reports and Expert Opinions reinforced the characterization of the situation as genocide. These reports highlighted prolific credible evidence of sterilization procedures, mass deaths, and other genocidal conduct. Experts pointed out that the Chinese government's actions in Xinjiang constituted a systematic and calculated campaign to destroy the Uyghur group. Scholarly organizations, 2021 scholarly organizations also weighed in on the matter, with the Canadian Anthropology Society issuing a statement confirming the scale of the genocide. Jewish Community and Other Organizations, 2021 a coalition of Jewish organizations, including the American Jewish Committee, issued an open letter urging additional action in response to the abuses against Uyghurs, including countering propaganda, strengthening sanctions, and increasing the number of Uyghur refugees admitted to the United States. This reflected a growing consensus among various groups. The labeling of China's actions in Xinjiang as genocide has gained momentum, with increasing numbers of experts, governments, and organizations recognizing the gravity of the situation and the need for international attention and action. It remains a subject of intense debate, scrutiny, and concern worldwide. Crimes Against Humanity, 2019-2021 The China Tribunal, an independent judicial investigation into forced organ transplantation in China, concluded in June 2019 that crimes against humanity had been committed beyond reasonable doubt against China's Uyghur Muslim and Falun Gong populations. This marked an early recognition of the gravity of the situation in Xinjiang and its violation of international law.
Legal and Academic Findings 2019-2021 Legal Experts in Academic Institutions, such as the Asia-Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect at the University of Queensland, have conducted extensive research and concluded that evidence of atrocities in Xinjiang likely meets the requirements for crimes against humanity. These include persecution, imprisonment, enforced disappearance, torture, forced sterilization, and enslavement. Some legal assessments argued that genocidal acts, particularly measures to prevent births and forcible transfers, had occurred in Xinjiang. U.S. Office of the Legal Advisor, 2021 and 2021, the U.S. Office of the Legal Advisor concluded that the situation in Xinjiang amounted to crimes against humanity, although it found insufficient evidence to prove genocide. This assessment reflects the ongoing debate and legal scrutiny regarding the situation in Xinjiang. Settler colonialism, ongoing some academics and researchers have characterized the abuses in Xinjiang as part of an ongoing project of Han settler colonialism. This perspective frames the actions in Xinjiang as part of a broader historical and contemporary context, emphasizing the colonization and displacement of indigenous populations. These various classifications, including crimes against humanity and settler colonialism, provide different lenses through which to understand and address the complex and multifaceted situation in Xinjiang. They reflect ongoing efforts to categorize and respond to the human rights abuses taking place there. Reactions by Supranational Organizations In July 2019, 22 countries jointly condemned China's human rights abuses in Xinjiang in a letter addressed to the United Nations Human Rights Council, UNHRC. The letter expressed grave concerns over China's mass detention of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities and called upon the Chinese government to cease arbitrary detentions and restrictions on the freedom of movement of these communities. Concurrently, during the same session of the UNHRC, another group comprising 50 countries issued a joint letter in support of China's policies in Xinjiang. This letter criticized what they perceived as the politicization of human rights issues, arguing that China had allowed diplomats, international organizations' officials, and journalists to visit Xinjiang, where they observed conditions that contrasted with media reports. In October 2019, 23 countries released a collective statement urging China to uphold its obligations concerning human rights. The statement highlighted the international community's concerns about the situation in Xinjiang. In response, a group of 54 countries, including China, issued a joint statement supportive of China's policies in Xinjiang. This statement commended the outcomes of counterterrorism and de-radicalization measures, emphasizing that these measures had safeguarded the basic human rights of all ethnic groups. In February 2020, the United Nations called for unobstructed access to Xinjiang in preparation for a proposed fact-finding visit to the region. By October 2020, the international condemnation of China's human rights abuses in Xinjiang had expanded, with more countries speaking out against these actions. The number of countries that condemned China's policies reached 39, while 45 countries continued to support China's stance. Notably, 16 countries that had previously defended China in 2019 changed their positions in 2020, joining the ranks of those expressing concerns. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, HCHR, entered into discussions with China in September 2020 regarding the possibility of a visit to Xinjiang. The aim of such a visit would be to examine the impact of China's policies on human rights in the region. Negotiations have occurred, but the High Commissioner has not yet conducted an official visit to Xinjiang. These responses reflect the complex and contentious nature of international reactions to the human rights abuses in Xinjiang with some countries condemning China's actions, while others express support for China's policies or argue against external interference. The issue remains a subject of ongoing debate and diplomatic negotiations on the international stage. Reactions at the European Union In 2019, the European Parliament awarded the prestigious Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought to Ilham Todi a Uyghur intellectual and activist who had received a life sentence on charges related to Uyghur separatism. Todi's imprisonment and the charges against him were strongly criticized. As of March 2021, the Chinese government had barred European Union diplomats from visiting Todi. The European Union consistently called for Todi's release from his detention in prison, 
emphasizing the importance of his case as a symbol of the broader human rights concerns related to Xinjiang. In March 2021, European Union ambassadors collectively decided to impose sanctions, including travel bans and asset freezes, on four Chinese officials and one Chinese entity for their involvement in human rights abuses against the Uyghur population. One of the officials sanctioned was Zhu Hailuan, identified as the architect of the indoctrination program in Xinjiang. These measures were taken in response to growing concerns about the treatment of Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities in Xinjiang. However, in the same month, negotiations for a group of European Union ambassadors to visit Xinjiang stalled because the Chinese government denied their request to visit Ilham Todi, an imprisoned Uyghur scholar and Sakharov Prize laureate. This event highlighted the ongoing diplomatic tensions surrounding the issue. On June 9, 2022, the European Parliament passed a motion condemning the actions taken against the Uyghur community in China. The motion explicitly mentioned credible evidence about birth prevention measures and the separation of Uyghur children from their families and stated that these actions amount to crimes against humanity and represent a serious risk of genocide. The European Parliament called on authorities to cease government-sponsored programs related to forced labor and mass forced sterilization. The motion further demanded an immediate halt to measures aimed at preventing births in the Uyghur population, including forced abortions or sanctions for birth control violations. This action by the European Parliament demonstrated the EU's deep concerns about the human rights situation in Xinjiang and its commitment to addressing the issue. Reactions by African Countries Several African countries, including Algeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Egypt, Nigeria, and Somalia, were signatories to a letter in July 2019 that publicly praised China's human rights record and dismissed reported abuses in Xinjiang. This stance aligned them with China's position on the issue. Additionally, other African countries, such as Angola, Burundi, Cameroon, the Central African Republic, Madagascar, Morocco, Mozambique, and Sudan signed a letter in October 2019 expressing their public support for China's treatment of Uyghurs. Their letters endorsed China's narrative regarding the situation in Xinjiang. In 2021, ambassadors from Burkina Faso, the Republic of Congo, and Sudan issued statements in support of China's Xinjiang policies. Burkina Faso's ambassador claimed that Western allegations of forced labor and genocide were groundless, while Sudan's ambassador argued that the Xinjiang issue was not primarily about human rights but rather a political tool employed by Western countries against China. These statements highlighted the differing views among African nations regarding the situation in Xinjiang and their relationships with China. Canada In July 2020, The Globe and Mail reported that human rights activists including retired politician Erwin Kotler, were urging the Parliament of Canada to recognize the abuses against Uyghurs in China as genocide and to impose sanctions on the officials responsible. This call for action reflected growing international concern regarding the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. On October 21, 2020, the Subcommittee on International Human Rights, SDR, of the Canadian House of Commons Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Development passed a resolution condemning the persecution of Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims in Xinjiang by the government of China. The subcommittee concluded that the actions of the Chinese Communist Party amounted to the genocide of the Uyghurs, as defined by the Genocide Convention. This formal recognition of genocide by a Canadian parliamentary body was a significant development. On February 22, 2021, the Canadian House of Commons voted 266 to 0 to pass a motion that officially recognized China as committing genocide against its Muslim minorities. Notably, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his cabinet did not vote on this motion. In response, China's ambassador to Canada dismissed the allegations of genocide and forced labor as the lie of the century. The motion marked a critical moment in Canada's stance on the issue. In June 2021, Canada's Senate voted 29 to 33 against a motion that sought to recognize the treatment of Uyghurs as genocide and to call for the 2022 Winter Olympics to be moved out of China should such treatment continue. The Senate's decision reflected the complexity and divisions within Canada's approach to the matter. On April 11, 2021, Canada issued a travel advisory, 
warning that individuals with familial or ethnic ties could be at risk of arbitrary detention by Chinese authorities when traveling in the Xinjiang region. The advisory highlighted the increasing concerns about arbitrary detentions in the region without due process. In 2023, the House of Commons unanimously voted in favor of a non-binding motion to accept 10,000 Uyghur refugees fleeing persecution in China over the course of two years. This action demonstrated Canada's commitment to assisting Uyghur refugees and providing humanitarian support. United States UN counterterrorism chief Vladimir Voronkov's visit to Xinjiang in June 2019 caused tensions between the United States and the United Nations due to concerns about the visit's objectivity. The United States criticized the visit as highly choreographed and accused it of propagating false narratives, further highlighting the international divisions over the issue. In 2020, the United States Congress passed the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act in response to the internment camps and the human rights situation in Xinjiang. Additionally, lawmakers proposed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which assumed that all Xinjiang goods involved forced labor and therefore proposed a ban on such products. These legislative measures aim to address concerns about forced labor and human rights abuses in the region. In September 2020, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security took action to block imports of products from five entities in Xinjiang as part of efforts to combat the use of forced labor. However, broader proposed bans were put on hold. A senior U.S. diplomat encouraged other countries to join the United States in condemning the Chinese government's policies in Xinjiang. In January 2021, then-Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced that the United States Department of State had determined that genocide and crimes against humanity had been committed by China against the Uyghurs and other ethnic and religious minority groups. This announcement drew historical parallels with other genocides and crimes against humanity, demonstrating the seriousness of the situation. During the transition to the Biden administration, President Joe Biden indicated that the United States would continue to recognize the situation in Xinjiang as a genocide. He also promised repercussions for China due to its human rights violations. Some interpretations of his statements suggested cultural relativism, while others saw them as a misrepresentation of his stance on the issue. In July 2021, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin remarked on genocide and crimes against humanity against Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. While speaking at the Singaporean branch of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, further highlighting the United States' commitment to addressing the crisis. In March 2023, the House of Representatives Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party held hearings on the ongoing genocide against Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in China's Xinjiang region, reinforcing the United States' efforts to address the issue on the international stage. Middle East Several Middle Eastern countries have expressed support for China's human rights record and policies in Xinjiang, often emphasizing their economic and political relations with China. Notable points of support include Many Middle Eastern countries signed a UN document defending China's human rights record, which included supporting its Xinjiang policies. This stance indicates a level of international support for China's position. Saudi Arabia and Egypt have been accused of deporting Uyghurs to China, which suggests cooperation with China's policies. Saudi Arabia openly supports China's approach in Xinjiang, with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman stating that China has the right to carry out anti-terrorism and de-extremization work for its national security. This statement highlights the diplomatic relations between the two countries. The United Arab Emirates has formally defended China's human rights records and appreciated China's principle of non-interference in other countries' affairs. These countries prioritize their diplomatic and economic ties with China. At the 2020 Ministerial Meeting of the China, Arab States Cooperation Forum, the Arab countries collectively expressed their support for China's position on Xinjiang, further solidifying their stance. Qatar Qatar initially supported China's policies in Xinjiang. However, on August 21, 2019, it became the first Middle Eastern country to withdraw its defense of the Xinjiang camps. This shift in Qatar's stance indicates the evolving international discourse surrounding China's actions in Xinjiang. Israel. In 2021, Israel voted to condemn China's actions in the UN Human Rights Council, UNHRC. This decision marked a sudden break in China, 
Israel relations and indicated Israel's shift in its approach to China's Xinjiang policies. Post-Soviet states Countries in the post-Soviet region, such as Russia, Belarus, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan, have expressed support for China's policies in Xinjiang. Russia, in particular, signed statements at the UN that supported China's Xinjiang policies in both July and October 2019. These countries support aligns with their relations with China and their economic interests. Kazakhstan and other Central Asian nations, which have benefited from Chinese investments, have been relatively silent on the issue of Muslims in internment camps in China, highlighting the complexities of diplomacy in the region. South Asia Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka have signed a UN document supporting China's policies in Xinjiang. Their support may stem from diplomatic or economic considerations. In July 2021, Prime Minister Imran Khan of Pakistan voiced his belief in the Chinese version of the situation in Xinjiang. He argued that the international focus on Xinjiang should be balanced with attention to human rights violations in other regions, such as Kashmir. Khan's statements indicate his government's alignment with China's perspective. Southeast Asia Countries in Southeast Asia, including Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and the Philippines, have issued statements supporting China's policies in Xinjiang. Additionally, some countries, such as Thailand, Malaysia, and Cambodia, have deported Uyghurs at China's request. In contrast, Malaysia declared that it would not entertain extradition requests from Beijing if Uyghurs felt their safety was at risk, highlighting the diversity of responses in the region. Turkey Turkey initially condemned China's repression of its Uyghur minority in Xinjiang, calling it a great shame for humanity. Turkish authorities raised concerns about arbitrary arrests, torture, and political brainwashing of Uyghur Turks in internment camps and prisons. In February 2021, Turkish authorities arrested Uyghur protesters in Ankara, following a complaint by the Chinese embassy. This event indicated Turkey's delicate position in its relations with China. In March 2021, the Turkish parliament rejected a motion to describe the Chinese government's treatment of Uyghurs as genocide, reflecting the complexity of Turkey's stance on the issue. In July 2021, President Erdogan spoke with Chinese President Xi Jinping and emphasized Turkey's interest in the prosperity and peace of Uyghur Turks as equal citizens of China while respecting China's territorial integrity and sovereignty. This phone call marked Turkey's careful balancing of human rights concerns and diplomatic relations. In 2022, Turkey joined 49 other UN member states in issuing a joint statement condemning the Chinese government's persecution of Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims in Xinjiang reflecting a renewed international stance against the situation. Belgium In May 2021, a testimony about the situation in Xinjiang to the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Belgian Chamber of Representatives had to be postponed due to a massive DDoS attack on the .b domain. The attack underscores the sensitivity and international attention surrounding this issue. In June 2021, the Belgian Parliament's Foreign Relations Committee passed a motion condemning the abuses in Xinjiang as crimes against humanity and stating a serious risk of genocide in the region. Belgium's response reflects its growing concern over the situation in Xinjiang. Czech Republic In June 2021, the Czech Senate unanimously passed a motion condemning the abuses against the Uyghurs as both genocide and crimes against humanity. The Czech Republic's strong stance aligns with the international trend of condemning China's actions in Xinjiang. France In December 2020, France announced its opposition to the proposed Comprehensive Agreement on Investment between China and the European Union due to concerns about the use of forced labor of Uyghurs. In February 2021, the French Foreign Minister, Jean-Yves Le Drian, denounced institutionalized repression of Uyghurs at the UN Human Rights Council. Furthermore. The French parliament passed a resolution in January 2022, officially denouncing China's actions as a genocide against its Uyghur Muslim population. France's condemnation reflects its commitment to human rights principles. Finland In March 2021, Finland's prime minister, Sanna Marin, publicly condemned the human rights situation in Xinjiang, highlighting the growing awareness and concern about the issue at the international level. Lithuania 
In May 2021, the Lithuanian parliament passed a resolution recognizing that the Chinese government's human rights abuses against the Uyghurs constitute genocide. Lithuania's official stance reflects its commitment to human rights and international legal standards. Netherlands On February 25, 2021, the Netherlands parliament passed a non-binding resolution declaring the Chinese government's actions against the Uyghurs as a genocide. This formal condemnation aligns the Netherlands with the global response to the situation in Xinjiang, Ukraine. Ukraine originally signed a statement to the UN Human Rights Council in June 2021, calling for independent observers to be provided immediate access to Xinjiang. However, Ukraine later withdrew its signature, citing pressure from China, which threatened to limit trade and block the shipment of COVID-19 vaccine doses. This withdrawal highlights the complexities of international relations and the economic pressures exerted by China. United Kingdom The United Kingdom has taken various measures to address the situation in Xinjiang. In October 2020, Britain's shadow foreign secretary, Lisa Nandy, suggested that the UK must oppose giving China a seat on the UN Human Rights Council in protest against its abuse of Uyghur Muslims. She emphasized the need for a UN inquiry into possible crimes against humanity in Xinjiang. In January 2021, the British Parliament rejected a resolution that would have banned the UK from trading with countries engaged in genocides, despite the support of more than 120 MPs and peers. Prime Minister Boris Johnson opposed the resolution. In the same month, Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab accused China of extensive and invasive surveillance targeting minorities systematic restrictions on Uyghur culture, education, and the practice of Islam, and the widespread use of forced labor. In March 2021, the UK and the EU imposed sanctions on four Chinese officials for their involvement in violating the human rights of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. In response, China imposed sanctions on nine UK citizens for spreading lies and disinformation about human rights abuses in Xinjiang. On April 22, 2021, the House of Commons unanimously passed a non-binding parliamentary motion declaring China's human rights abuses in Xinjiang as a genocide. The UK's multifaceted response reflects its commitment to addressing the situation and its alignment with international efforts to hold China accountable. Australia Australia has expressed concerns about the situation in Xinjiang and has taken steps to address it. In September 2019, Australian Foreign Minister Maurice Payne stated that Australia had consistently raised concerns about reports of mass detentions of Uyghurs and other Muslim peoples in Xinjiang. The country called for China to cease the arbitrary detention of Uyghurs and other Muslim groups, both in bilateral discussions and in relevant international meetings. However, in March 2021, the Australian federal government blocked a motion by Rex Patrick to officially recognize China's treatment of the Uyghurs as a genocide. This indicates Australia's ongoing engagement with the issue and its efforts to address human rights abuses in Xinjiang. New Zealand New Zealand has also engaged with the Xinjiang issue. In 2018, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern raised concerns about Xinjiang during her visit to China, particularly during discussions with Guangdong Party Secretary Leader Li Xi. This showed New Zealand's willingness to address human rights issues in its diplomatic relations. Ardern further discussed Xinjiang privately with Chinese President Xi Jinping in 2019 following the Christchurch mosque shootings. The New York Times accused New Zealand of being cautious on this issue due to economic ties with China, as New Zealand exports various products to China, including milk, meat, and wine. On May 5, 2021, the New Zealand Parliament adopted a motion declaring that severe human rights abuses were occurring against the Uyghur people in Xinjiang. An earlier version of the motion had accused the Chinese government of committing genocide against the Uyghurs, but the ruling Labour Party opposed including the term genocide. The adopted motion, however, criticizes severe human rights abuses. This signifies New Zealand's efforts to address the human rights concerns related to Xinjiang while considering its economic relationships. Non-governmental organizations and research institutions have played a significant role in raising awareness about the situation in Xinjiang and providing their perspectives on the matter. East Turkestan Government in Exile 
In January 2020, President Ghulam Osman Yama of the East Turkestan government in exile expressed concern about the ongoing oppression of Uyghurs and called on the international community, including world governments, to recognize China's actions in Xinjiang as a genocide. Uyghur American Association This organization expressed concerns about the deportation of Uyghur refugees from Cambodia to China in 2009. They have also referred to Beijing's approach to counterterrorism in Xinjiang as state terrorism. United States Holocaust Memorial Museum The museum has issued statements characterizing the conditions in Xinjiang as crimes against humanity. They have described China's campaign against the Uyghurs as multifaceted and systematic, involving mass detention, forced labor, discriminatory laws, and high-tech surveillance. Amnesty International As of July 2020, Amnesty International had not officially characterized the Chinese government's treatment of Uyghurs as genocide. However, in June 2021, Amnesty released a report stating that China's treatment of Uyghurs constituted crimes against humanity. Genocide Watch Genocide Watch issued a genocide emergency alert in November 2020, considering the forced sterilizations and forcible transfer of Uyghur and other Turkic minority children in Xinjiang as acts of genocide. Open letter by activist groups. In September 2020, nearly two dozen activist groups, including the Uyghur Human Rights Project, Genocide Watch, and the European Center for the Responsibility to Protect, signed an open letter urging the United Nations Human Rights Council, UNHRC, to investigate whether crimes against humanity or genocide were taking place in Xinjiang. New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy, in March 2021. This think tank at the Fairfax University of America released a report stating that the People's Republic of China bore state responsibility for committing genocide against the Uyghurs, citing evidence of comprehensive state policy and practice. They concluded that the Chinese government was in breach of the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Human Rights Watch In April 2021, Human Rights Watch released a report outlining that the Chinese government had committed crimes against humanity against the Turkic Muslim population in Xinjiang. While they had not documented the existence of genocidal intent at the time, they noted that nothing in the report precluded such a finding. If evidence of genocidal intent were to emerge, it could support a finding of genocide. These organizations and reports have contributed to international discussions and efforts to address human rights abuses in Xinjiang. The Uyghur Tribunal is a people's tribunal established in the United Kingdom with the aim of examining evidence related to China's treatment of Uyghurs and determining whether it constitutes genocide under the Genocide Convention. The tribunal began conducting hearings in June 2021 and was chaired by Jeffrey Nice, who previously served as the lead prosecutor in the trial of Slobodan Milosevic. After months of hearings and reviewing extensive evidence, on December 9, 2021, the Uyghur Tribunal reached a conclusion. The tribunal found that China had committed genocide against the Uyghurs, specifically through birth control and sterilization measures. They also identified evidence of other serious crimes, including crimes against humanity, torture, and sexual abuse. It is important to note that the tribunal's final determination does not have legal authority to compel governments to take specific actions. However, it serves as an important step in the ongoing international discourse on the situation in Xinjiang and the treatment of the Uyghur population. The findings of the tribunal have contributed to the growing body of evidence and calls for action to address human rights abuses in the region. Multinational corporations have faced increased scrutiny and public pressure in response to human rights concerns related to their business operations in Xinjiang. The proposed Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act in the United States aimed to impose sanctions on foreign persons knowingly engaging in forced labor practices and required firms to disclose their dealings with Xinjiang. In response, the president of the American Apparel and Footwear Association expressed concerns that blanket import bans on Xinjiang cotton or products could disrupt legitimate supply chains. As Xinjiang cotton is often mixed with cotton from other regions, and there is no efficient origin tracing technology for cotton fibers. Furthermore, some major companies with supply chain ties to Xinjiang, including Apple, Nike, and Coca-Cola, have lobbied Congress to weaken the legislation and amend its provisions, drawing criticism from human rights advocates. In February 2021, 
12 Japanese companies established a policy to discontinue business deals with certain Chinese firms linked to or benefiting from forced labor of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Notably, both Nike and Adidas have criticized human rights abuses in Xinjiang and pledged not to do business in the region, which led to a decline in their sales in China. Additionally, a report in December 2022 revealed that nearly every global automaker had ties to Uyghur forced labor, prompting the United Auto Workers to call for all automakers to sever supply chain links to Xinjiang. Multinational corporations continue to navigate complex ethical and economic considerations related to their operations in Xinjiang. Religious groups, including prominent figures and organizations, have raised concerns and taken actions related to the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. In July 2020, Marie van der Zyl, the president of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, drew parallels between the mass detention of Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps during the Holocaust. She continued to raise awareness of the issue, urging the Chinese government to step back from committing atrocities, especially on International Holocaust Remembrance Day in January 2021. In December 2020, Chief Rabbi Ephraim Mirvis of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth condemned the persecution of the Uyghurs and called for international action to address the unfathomable mass atrocity occurring in China. While Chief Rabbi Mirvis typically refrains from commenting on non-Jewish political issues, he, along with a broader Jewish protest movement, was motivated by memories of the Holocaust and a desire to prevent a recurrence of such horrors. In the United States, a coalition of American Muslim groups criticized the Organization of Islamic Cooperation for its perceived inaction in preventing the abuse of Uyghurs, accusing member states of being influenced by China's power. In August 2020, a group of 70 British faith leaders, including imams, rabbis, bishops, cardinals, and an archbishop, declared that the Uyghurs were facing one of the most egregious human tragedies since the Holocaust and called for accountability for those responsible. This group also included the representative of the Dalai Lama in Europe and Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury. In March 2021, a group of 16 rabbis and a cantor from California's Jewish religious spectrum sent a letter to Representative Ted Liu, urging him to take action in support of the Uyghurs. The Jewish Movement for Uyghur Freedom is a grassroots organization working to bridge the gap between the Uyghur and Jewish communities while advocating for the Uyghurs' rights and well-being. Several Jewish organizations and leaders in the United States and the United Kingdom have publicly spoken out against the Uyghur genocide or taken policy positions on the issue. These organizations include the Union for Reform Judaism, the American Jewish Committee, the Rabbinical Assembly, the Anti-Defamation League, the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, and the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. In 2021, several Jewish organizations in the United Kingdom incorporated the situation in Xinjiang into their Holocaust Memorial Day remembrances and commemorations, emphasizing the importance of remembering and speaking out against atrocities. Protests, boycotts, and legal cases have been some of the ways in which individuals and groups have sought to address the human rights abuses against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Regular protests outside Chinese diplomatic sites have taken place in various locations. In Almaty, Kazakhstan, a daily protest demonstration by Uyghurs, primarily composed of elderly women with detained relatives, has been ongoing. Similar protests have occurred outside the Consulate General of China in Los Angeles, where Uyghur protesters were joined by activists representing Tibet, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. In Istanbul, Turkey, local Uyghurs have organized regular protests outside Chinese diplomatic sites, with hundreds of Uyghur women participating in a protest on International Women's Day in March 2021. In London, a local Orthodox Jewish man has been leading protests outside an outpost of the Chinese embassy, with regular protests occurring since February 2019. In March 2021, hundreds of Uyghurs living in Turkey protested the visit of Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi to Istanbul. Over two dozen NGOs focused on Uyghur rights were involved in organizing these protests. N.S. Kanner, a professional basketball player, protested against abuses against the Uyghurs by wearing sneakers on court with messages such as modern-day slavery and no more excuses. He also criticized Nike for its silence on human rights abuses in China and expressed disappointment in the lack of response from Muslim-majority countries.
concerns and controversies surrounding the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing emerged, with calls for a boycott due to China's human rights abuses, particularly in Xinjiang. Several countries, including Australia, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, India, Kosovo, Lithuania, Taiwan, the United Kingdom, and the United States, announced diplomatic boycotts of the event. In January 2022, 19 Uyghurs, with the assistance of lawyer Golden Sanmez, filed a criminal case in the Istanbul Prosecutor's Office against Chinese officials. The case accuses the officials of torture, rape, crimes against humanity, and genocide. The legal action is based on Turkish legislation that recognizes universal jurisdiction for the alleged offenses. Nuri Turkle published the book, No Escape, The True Story of China's Genocide of the Uyghurs in 2022. The book documents the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang and was long listed for the 2022 Moore Prize for Human Rights Writing. The Chinese government has consistently denied the allegations of human rights abuses against the Uyghurs and related ethnic groups, both internally and externally. These denials have been part of a broader propaganda effort. Some key points regarding the denial of abuses include Propaganda campaigns The Chinese government has employed propaganda campaigns on social media platforms to promote denial of the abuses. In 2021, thousands of videos were posted on social media, featuring Xinjiang residents denying claims of abuse. A joint investigation by ProPublica and the New York Times revealed that these videos were part of a coordinated influence campaign directed by the CCP's Central Propaganda Department. Disinformation Networks The Chinese government has used existing disinformation networks, including social media trolls, to deny the allegations of genocide and other human rights abuses against Uyghurs. Denial by officials Chinese officials including the ambassador to the UK Lu Xiaoming and Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson Zhao Lijian, have publicly denied the existence of abuses and have labeled reports of forced sterilizations as lies. Or the lie of the century. Denial by a minority of left-wing media outlets. Some American left-wing media outlets, such as The Grey Zone, have published articles denying China's repression of Uyghurs. These outlets have been criticized for their stance on the issue. Social media companies' role Facebook has faced scrutiny for accepting content from Chinese state media outlets that deny mistreatment of Uyghurs. Impact of denialism Critics argue that denialism regarding the situation in Xinjiang may ultimately serve to aid both Chinese and American imperialism. Funding of denial networks Reports indicate that Neville Roy Singham funds a network of nonprofits and groups, including Code Pink, that deny or downplay human rights abuses against Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslim minorities in Xinjiang. It's important to note that the denial of these abuses is a significant point of contention, with many international bodies, governments, and organizations holding China accountable for human rights violations in Xinjiang.